Oh, what's up, family? It's your man, Daryl II. Um, I wanted to come and drop a word. God really, you know, he like he speaks to my heart, and it's, it's a blessing to have that. As a believer, he says, my sheep know my voice, and a stranger's voice they will not follow. I encourage you to get familiar with the, with your shepherd, the good shepherd, so that you can hear his voice and be drawing nigh to him on a regular basis. That way you can have that relationship, because I'm grateful to be in this position, but if there's anything I can tell you at everything I say, go to him for yourself. He uses people, but he wants to talk to you because he wants a relationship with you. There's a song. I don't know who sang it, but my dad sang it years ago. I don't know who the originator was, but it's from Jeremiah. It's based off of Jeremiah 29, 11, I believe. <clears throat> and it goes like this. When you seek me, you shall find me. If you search with all your heart. I will bring you out of bondage. I will bring you home to me. I'm going to sing one more time. When you seek me, you shall find me. If you search with all your heart, I will bring you out of bondage. To a land I have prepared. I don't know the order of the song. I will bring you out of bondage. I will bring you home to me. For I know the plans I have for you. Plans of welfare, not of evil. For I know... The plans I have for you, plans of hope and a future, I will bring you out of bondage to a land I have prepared. I will bring you out of bondage, I will bring you home to me. When you seek me, you shall find me. If you search with all your hearts, when you seek me, you will find me. If you search with all your hearts, <clears throat> I, I may bring it back up again, guys. I'm, I need to drink some water. Um, but the reason I'm bringing this video to your attention is because. I want to talk about embracing those dark times. But before I go further, let's go before the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, as I bring this word, I pray that I am used as an instrument and that the Holy Spirit is the one who is playing the music. Father, I pray that the people who hear this message would not be preoccupied with the instrument, but that they would be drawn to the one playing it, who is you. And so, Father, I pray that the hearts and minds of those who hear this message would be prepared for the word that you have put in my heart to share. And I pray that the presence of you would touch their hearts and minds in such a way that they know without a doubt they're not only hearing an inspired message, but they are feeling the presence of the one true living God. I pray transformation would occur in their life to such a degree that they can't do anything but attribute the credit to you. And I pray that people would have a remarkable testimony where no matter what they're going through, whatever they're facing, the other side would be a demonstration of what you can do in a person's life if we allow you to be a part of our life. Father, I am the clay, you are the potter, and I pray that you have your way, not only in my life, but I pray that those who hear this would also have the same mindset and would surrender themselves to pliability so that you could move in their lives to such a degree that you're glorified and that they get to be recipients of the blessings that come with that, but more so be living sacrifices and carry their cross as a demonstration of servitude to your son, Jesus the Christ. I pray the same for myself. In the mighty name of Jesus the Christ, I pray. I plead the blood of Jesus on this message. And Father, anything in me not of you, remove right now. Have your way in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, y'all. I'm, I'm able to talk. God, I, I feel I'm about to get recharged in a prayer. All right. So I say embrace the dark times, but what I really mean is embrace God during the dark times. And, it, and it's okay. The Bible says weeping may endure for the night, but joy comes in the morning. You know, I was at a work training yesterday and we were talking about a number of different things. 
Um, but one of the things we mentioned was um, one of the presenters, she had a butterfly that was presented and she had a caterpillar and she was just talking about that transition. And God brought something to my mind that I shared there. I remember years ago in a, a sermon I heard at a church, he was talking about the word transformation, I believe. It's in the New Testament. I think the Greek word for it was metaphormizo, I think, or metaphormizo, met something. And it means basically metamorphosis. It's the significance is the same as transformation. And what we were talking about, how is the caterpillar is in one state, but then he goes into the cocoon. And during the process of the cocoon, that's where the transformation occurs, that dark, isolated time. And when that occurs, once they're done being in there, they come out of the transition, they are a butterfly. But you cannot be a butterfly until you go through the stages of transformation from a caterpillar to the cocoon. And when I brought this up yesterday, what was cool was someone else in there was able to add on to what I said. Um, what I said was how once the caterpillar has become a butterfly, their wings, they cannot help have someone assist them with taking them out of the cocoon. They have to use their wings themselves because in doing so, it strengthens their wings. And I think it's what jumpstarts them getting accustomed to using their wings so that they can fly. And if that process is interrupted by somebody, they won't fly. They'll fall down and die because they don't know how to use their wings yet. That's very critical. But someone else said something interesting. They said there is a process that is called the imaginal, the imaginal cells or the reimaginal cells. And she described it as there being a liquid of secretion that basically eats the body of the caterpillar. And it's a reimagining, a redeveloping, a reshaping, a reformulating of the body where it leaves the old body that it once was and it becomes the new butterfly. But none of this could occur. And she said the same thing I said. It's critical that this, this cocoon period is the most critical part of the process. They must go through this to become who they are. And so it's a period of darkness. It's a period of isolation. It's a period of change. But on the other side, they can do things that they once were not able to do. When you're a caterpillar, the potential to fly and be a butterfly exists on the inside of you. But until you go through the transition, until you go through the change, until you go through that dark period, you cannot come out on the other side. And so often people want to start out as a butterfly, but they don't know what it's like to be a caterpillar. It reminds me of the valley and it reminds me of the mountaintop. The mountaintop is a beautiful thing. You have great experiences. You see the, the, everything from an aerial viewpoint. The air is thinner up there. It's refreshing. It's different. But what I've been told is that that mountaintop, after a while, that air thins, you start to have a headache. You can't be up there too long, but it's an exhilarating experience because you see so much. But the valley, the valley is where you're face to face with certain things. You're in close proximity. You're closer to the ground. You see things not from so far. You're right there. And in the valley, that's when certain things have to be addressed. Confrontation, sometimes with yourself, characteristics, things that need to be addressed, adjusted, developed, removed, improved, takes place in the valley. You're equipped in the valley. And then you can have a mountaintop experience. But we all have to go back to the valley. I love how David said in Psalm 23, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil because you are with me. That's critical because in the valley, things can happen. But like he said, he has no reason to fear evil because God, the good shepherd, is with him. And so there are times in our life where mountaintop experiences come and they're amazing and they're incredible. But before you have certain mountaintop experiences, you must be prepared, equipped, developed, and refined in the valley. Because then elevation can occur. When you try to ascend to elevation and it's not yet your time, you're not going to be successful because what is up there, you cannot yet handle because you have not been developed down here to prepare you for up here. Imagine going to the gym, getting under the bench press, wanting to lift a significant amount of weight, but you've never done a push up in your life. You never lifted anything heavy in your life. Do you think the chances of you lifting that high weight are positive or negative? it's a higher likelihood that it's negative. There's, there's a higher chance that you're going to fail because you have not gone through the stages of preparation to be able to handle that weight. It's a celebration when you can lift that weight, but it's a process of preparation, sacrifice, rest, patience, and growth before you can get to that point. And so it is in the life of a believer. We go through things. We go through stages. We go through phases. We go through situations of hardship, difficulty, 
burdens, obscurity, and we're in the darkness. And sometimes we are not noticed because we are in the darkness. However, when you are in the darkness, you are not alone. As I said in the book of Psalms, weeping may endure for the night, but joy comes in the morning. Sometimes when we are in the darkness, we consider the darkness to be a negative thing, but sometimes it's not. Sometimes the darkness is the secret place where God does things in hidden mystery and it later becomes revealed in the light. But in the darkness, that is our time to trust him. In the darkness, that is our time to know that we are not alone and that we can depend upon him because he will guide us. As a matter of fact, in the darkness, moments when we are not sure of what is next or what to do, we can depend on God's word. His word says in the book of Psalms, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. We associate darkness with negative things, but sometimes darkness is a place where God can equip us, improve us and develop us in such a way that it is humbling us, maturing us, refining us and drawing us closer to him so that when he elevates us, we still have the character of Christ. And we don't allow the success of elevation, our mountaintop experiences to go to our head and allow us to attribute the success to ourselves. The Bible says no flesh shall glory in his presence. And so when we spend time in the darkness, it's those moments that we're clinging to the father. It's those moments that brokenness is occurring. It's those moments that we are opening ourselves to be utilized because in the brokenness, there is humility. And he says he humbles the, uh, the, the lowly, but he, ex he exalts the lowly. That's what he says, but he opposes the proud. And so when you go through the stages that he is prepared for you to go, you can be sure that you are going to be humbled in some areas. You're going to be tested. You're going to be improved so that when it's time to go where he's called you, you are ready. You are really the product. You are not a counterfeit. You are the presentation that he has desired for you to be. You are a representation of his son. You are a reflection of him and his glory will manifest through you because you went through the process in the darkness. As I talked about this in the story of Joseph, Genesis 37, he was betrayed by his own family. He had been promised a great destiny through dreams and he had prophetic dreams of one day ruling and his brothers serving under him. He shared these dreams maybe prematurely and as a result, it continued to contribute to the jealousy and hatred his brothers had already had towards him and they sold him into slavery. And it was during those dark years that he went through so much. He was lied on by his boss's wife. She wanted to sleep with him. He refused. She lied and said he tried to sleep and rape her. He was thrown in jail. Yet God was with him in those moments. He had already been betrayed. Then he got lied on after he was sold into slavery. All these things in the darkness of obscurity, he seemed like to be an afterthought, something that was once forgotten. But God didn't forget him. He stayed faithful to God during those hard times. And then a need came that only he could fulfill. The king of the land, Pharaoh, started having troubling dreams that made no sense. And Joseph had helped some individuals prior to this point. And one of those individuals was in the service of the king. And he remembered Joseph and told the king about him. And as a result, Joseph was immediately elevated, brought to the king. And he heard the king's dreams. And God gave him the interpretation. And the dreams were dreams of warning. They were dreams of seven years of plenty and seven years of famine. And they were a sign that someone needed to be prepared because those times were coming. And he said, you need to appoint a wise man who can orchestrate organization, bring together all the food that is necessary so that over the course of time, we will survive and we will live. This man said, who's wiser than you? Joseph, just like that, went from being a slave, betrayed by his brothers, to being lied on by a woman, to being in prison, to now being in a position of influence. He was second in command because of God. The word of God says promotion does not come from the east nor the west, but it comes from God above. Are you serving God through the hard times? He's going to test you. Now, I'm going to pause for a moment because on Instagram, this stops at 15 minutes. If you're watching and you have not made Jesus the Lord of your life, when you leave this earth, you will face eternity. And if you have not had a relationship with him, unfortunately, you will not make it to heaven. John 3, 16 says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son and that whoever believes in him will not perish, but will have everlasting life. Will there be hard times? Yes. Will there be dark times? Yes. That's what we're talking about. Nevertheless, he will be your guiding light. If you would like to know him, then repeat after me, Lord Jesus, I believe you died on the cross and that God, the father raised you back from the dead. Please come into my heart and be my Lord and savior. If you did that, you're going to heaven. Your name is written in the book of life. 
get in a Bible-based church and watch God transform your life and get baptized in water because you got to be born again of water and spirit. You see, our works don't save us. It's grace through faith in him, what he did on the cross that saves us. He lived a perfect life and never sinned, and he became your scapegoat. My mother has a great book called New Believers, A New Life in Christ Jesus. I highly recommend you get it. God bless you. Okay, I'm gonna go back, y'all. That was like a commercial. <laughs> now, I'm, for the YouTubers, we're gonna continue. So Joseph, just like that, was elevated to second in command. I believe the term, not high priest, what was the term? There is a particular term that is used even today, and it was the same position that he was in. It'll come to me. The point of the matter is when he went about God's way and he stayed faithful, God elevated him. But it was through those dark times, those dark moments, those moments when he was forgotten about, those moments when he was looked down upon because he was not in high status. It was in those moments that God began to equip him, prepare him, develop him, fire him up, strengthen him so that when it was time to lift him up, he would know whose he was and who he was. And he would not forget that it was God that gave him a testimony. You see a testimony, the first word in the word testimony is test and you will be tested. The Bible says much is given. It says to whom much is given, much is required. Are you willing to pay the cost? I saw a word today from a woman of God by the name of Jill Sharp. She said, many people want the anointing, but they don't want to go through the brokenness that it takes. People want the anointing. They want to be used by God in a mighty way for their own glory. But God is like, no flesh or glory in my presence. And so when God uses you, he breaks you so that he can use you in a mighty demonstrative fashion. A friend of mine named Megan told me this years ago, she said to me, because her father was a farmer, she said that sheep, they like to roam and do whatever they want to do. And the, she said the shepherds have to, they have a staff and they have a, um, a rod. The staff has the hook. It is to yank the sheep when they're caught in the thicket or caught in different things. But she said the rod, the rod is to knock them on the head if they keep being hard headed and doing what they want to do. And so sheeps are considered to be unintelligent animals that do what they want to. And so it takes the shepherd to guide them. And she said, if they continue to be hard headed, what the shepherd does is it gets the lamb and it breaks the lamb's leg so that the lamb is partially injured, but the lamb depends on the shepherd. She said, this makes the lamb draw closer to the shepherd as he lifts it up and carries it. She said, the lamb leans on the shepherd and it's brokenness. It leans to the shepherd. So when God breaks you in the darkness, that's a time to lean on the shepherd. When God breaks you, that's an opportunity for you to draw closer to the shepherd. Because as you do so, you are revealed different things because he's talking to you. The intimacy is developed. The maturity in you is developed. The growth of the relationship is developed. And you can hear him more clearly because you are seeking him in the darkness. Will there be hard times? Will you cry in moments? Absolutely. Jesus wept. What makes you think you won't? As a matter of fact, even in the darkest of times, God will still show you that he is faithful. When Jesus died, it was a dark time across the land. The Bible talks about there being an earthquake as a result and people who were once dead coming back to life. When Jesus died, it was a dark, dark, dark time. There was a great deal of mourning because it seemed all hope was lost. Nevertheless, when Jesus died, it was hope that was becoming fulfilled. In fact, the Bible says hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a dream fulfilled is a tree of life. Little do they know that there was a dream being fulfilled. You see, Jesus went down to hell and he conquered death and the grave. He went to those who were in a waiting position and he elevated back to earth when he came back three days later and he left gifts for the church, the body of Christ. But he took, he went and ascended and he took, he took, I'm not, oh my word, excuse me. Those who have been waiting, they can go to heaven. Let me just say that. I'm trying to, it's a scripture. I'm trying to say it the right way. Caffeine's buzzing off. <laughs> Caffeine's wearing off. My point in all this, it appeared to be one way, but it turned out to be something different. There's a scripture that says it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him. Now, my understanding is having a relationship with him, having that encounter with him, you become more like him. That's my understanding because shall was added. This is going off of what I've, I've heard and listened over the years. But my point in all this is this, in the darkness, draw to him. In the darkness, don't you give up. You understand me? Romans 8, 28 says, all things work together for the good of those who love God and who are called according to his purpose. 
That means the good, the bad, and the ugly are going to work together for the good of those who love God and who are called according to his purpose. He has a purpose for you in your brokenness, in your darkness. He has called you to something. And so don't you give up just because you encounter some darkness. Weeping may endure for the night, but joy comes in the morning. And I want to inspire these young kids today dealing with suicide. That is the devil. And the devil is a liar. God has a plan for your life. And if you trust him, you will get on the other side of that darkness and you will have purpose in your life. Because just like the caterpillar has to go through the cocoon before he becomes the butterfly, so do you in the darkness. I'm going to read Romans 5 really quick. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also rejoice in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not disappoint us because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given us. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good man, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if when we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more having been reconciled shall we be saved through this life? Not only is this so, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. That's deep, y'all. I'm going to just finish this. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, and in this way, death came to all men. Because all sin, for before the law was given, sin was in the world. But sin is not taken into account when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even over those who did not sin by breaking a command, as did Adam, who was a pattern of the one to come. But the gift is not like the trespass. For if the many died by the trespass of one man, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many? In other words, he's saying a lot of people died because of Adam, but a lot of people are alive because of Jesus. Again, the gift of God is not like the result of the one man's sin. The judgment followed one sin and brought condemnation, but the gift followed many trespasses and brought justification. For if by the trespass of the one man death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and of the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man Christ Jesus? Consequently, just as the result of one trespass was condemnation for all men, so also the result of one act of righteousness was justification that brings life for all men. For just as through the disobedience of the one man, the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man, the many will be made righteous. The law was added so that the trespass might increase. But where sin increased, grace increased all the more. So that just as sin reigned in death, so also grace might reign through righteousness to bring eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. I said a lot. If you got any questions, feel free to add, ask. But I just want to emphasize the goodness of God. The goodness of God. The goodness of God sending his son Jesus to die for us. In the darkness, God was up to something. Behind the scenes, God was up to something. And I want to encourage you the next time that you find yourself going through hard times in the darkest darkness, just know weeping may endure for the night, but it is joy that comes in the morning. So you praise God while you stay in the darkness. In closing, there are two books that I recommend that you check out. This is my second recently published book. It's called Random Thoughts of a Believer, Life Lessons for the Believer. It was a blessing to write it, and it'll be a blessing to you. I highly recommend you check it out. But in addition to this, let me let me tell you about this other book right here. This is from Dr. Marvell Alder, my mother, pastor as well. She wrote this book for new believers. New Believers, A New Life in Christ Jesus by Marvell Alder. A wonderful, wonderful read. An easy read, but it also gives great explanation as certain questions come to your mind being newly saved. And even if you're not a new saint, it's a great read, period. 
I highly recommend you check it out. It's also online. My name is Daryl the Second. It's always a pleasure. All the glory, all the honor, and all the praise goes to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Thank you so much for the kind words. It, it means a lot. As, as the word of God indicates, I am his servant, but I'm honored and I appreciate the kind remarks that you all give me. It blesses my heart and it's very encouraging. So thank you for the, the nice words. I really do appreciate them. If I ever always turn the direction back to the Lord, it's not meant to dismiss anything you say. It's my way of reminding myself that even though I'm appreciative of the love and I, I receive it, I receive the love, I receive it. I also want people to know it's all about him. God bless you.